Uh, so good morning, uh, everyone, and thank you for joining us here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Uh, I'm Haran Vijanathan, and I'm the Director of Equity and Growth here at the museum. And thank you so much for joining us this morning, um, which is your last day of the conference, is it not? Yes, great. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your breakfast. I've hoped you enjoyed uh, the conference. I'm, I've looked at the agenda and it looked like a real robust conversation, lots of good learning and networking. So congratulations on completing that and, and, and all the best wishes as you move forward with the knowledge that you've gained. Um, and it is our custom here at the museum to acknowledge that we are gathered on, um, oh, sorry, I want to get this right. Uh, the Canadian Museum for Human Rights is located on ancestral lands on Treaty 1 territory, crossroads of the Anishinaabek, Inuit, Anishinaabek, Dene, and Dakota peoples. Uh, the Red River Valley is, all of the, uh, is also the birthplace of the Métis, and we acknowledge our Inuit relatives in the north and the ancestral lands they all come home, that they all call home. We also acknowledge the water in the museum is sourced from Shoal Lake 40 First Nation, and our hydroelectricity is generated by waterways in the north on the Treaty 5 lands and by the Winnipeg River in Treaty 3 territory. Uh, the museum is committed to reconciliation, which begins with our acknowledgement that Canada committed genocide against Indigenous peoples. The Indian residential school system is a key component of this genocide, but we also acknowledge acts of genocide against thousands of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and 2S LGBTQ people, and we will continue to bring these stories to light in our work at the museum. And now, it is my pleasure to invite Elder Albert McLeod uh, to uh, start us off in a good way. Um, and Elder McLeod is a language and knowledge keeper, a leader who serves so many organizations and a community member who cares for so many. We are grateful to have him be the elder on the Purge Advisory Council to help guide the work of creating an exhibit that speaks to the truth of the atrocities committed by our very own government. Um, elder McLeod. I can offer you tobacco as well, thank you. Thank you, Haran, and welcome everybody uh, to this session this morning. My name is Albert McLeod, and I originally come from northern Manitoba from a little village called Cormorant. I was born in 1955, so that makes me 66 this year. And I, uh, along with many of you in this room, uh, I'm a survivor of homophobia, transphobia, anti-Indigenous racism in Canada. I live in the south, mostly amongst the Ojibwe people who have generously shared their knowledge, their teachings, their ceremonies, their language and their life philosophy uh, with the people of southern Manitoba and the newcomers that came into this territory in the 1700s. So it has been a long journey, a long trajectory of building human rights in this territory. And as Haran said, we are in Treaty 1 territory. And the signing of Treaty 1 happened only a few blocks from where we sit. It was amongst the Ojibwe, the Cree, and the Assiniboine peoples who had negotiated with the settlers uh, to enable agriculture to happen on the Great Plains of the North. And that did happen subsequently. As well as we are in the homeland of the Métis Nation, and we know that history uh, in the reality that uh, Louis Riel was a member of our parliament, but was never allowed to take a seat in our parliament to help govern our country. In doing this opening invocation, I want to acknowledge some elders and knowledge keepers that are with us in the room. Our delegation from South America, Olawali Green, where are you? There you are. Uh, from Colombia. Monica Chubb from Guatemala. <laughs> Fernando Alvarez from Guatemala. <laughs> and, I, and Andrew Baker for the International Gay and Lesbian Association. as well as Steve and Isabel Miawasaki from uh, Certain River. <laughs> uh, 
and Sven Robinson, one of our knowledge keepers and elders. <laughs> as well as some of the uh, PERT survivors who's been active at our conference and in the meetings that have happened this week in Winnipeg, uh, sitting at that table there, and they were part of the film screened yesterday, The Fruit Machine. Uh, and so that is part of our acknowledgement um, of our territory as we acknowledge those survivors and knowledge keepers that have stayed true to our beliefs as human beings and our right to desire, attraction, pleasure, intimacy, lust, and love. That is the basis of this. And it's not just about sexuality. It is who we find comfort with that we recognize as a soul that recognizes our soul in our life journey. Someone who will help pay the rent, take the garbage out, do the laundry, <laughs> take the cat out for a walk, all those little things. And I like to say, the Pope is coming to Canada in the end of July to apologize, I guess, for the damage done by the various churches, and particularly the Catholic Church in Canada during the colonial period. And I know through the establishment of our civil government, our military, including the Navy and the Army, as well as the RCMP, that that dogma influenced that discrimination, that violence, not just lateral violence, but physical violence over the last 150 years. And we are the survivors. Everyone in this room is a survivor of that era. So I want to acknowledge you all. And I think the message to the Pope should be desire, attraction, and pleasure because that will sound like the scraping of nails on a classroom uh, you know, board. Because that's what it is. It's about being human, as humans are meant to be. Not from a dogma, and certainly not from a paper book. So in the invocation, we call in spirit. And today, because this is about um, the purge and its devastating result on other Canadian citizens, in the modern era, we call in the spirits of those survivors, as well as those who have passed into the spiritual world, who have been transformed into spirit beings. And from an indigenous perspective, we can still communicate with them, and they can still communicate with us, even though the physical journey has ended. So we turn to the east doorway. We open that doorway and call in the winds and call in those spirits to be with us today to hear our words, to see us as we are today. We turn to the south doorway and open that doorway and call in those winds, those spirits to join us. We turn to the west doorway, we call in those spirits from the west doorway to join us. We open that doorway. We turn to the north doorway. We open that doorway and we call those spirits to join us, to hear our words, to see our smiles, to see our tears, to see our fears, to see our joy, because that is our journey from birth to death. It's no better or worse. And in those spiritual world, they, some of them will remember that time when they were physical beings. And in this petition, in this invocation, we ask them to guide us, to help us on this journey into the future because we know fascism is trying to resurge in the 21st century, and we must remain vigilant to that reality that is around us, that may be in our neighborhood, may be in our organization, that we need to be vigilant. And I think that was the greatest teaching of the movie, the film that was screened last night, The Fruit Machine, is to be vigilant. So it's upon all of our shoulders to continue that vigilance as we move forward to, to protect the future generations of two-spirit LGBTQ youth in our nation. So miigwech, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, um, Elder Albert. Um, 
I want to recognize all the survivors of the purge, community leaders and change makers, which is everybody in this room who are with us today. The fact that so many of you made the decision to join this conversation and to learn more about our history and the impact on not just the queer community, but society as a whole is so great. So thank you so much for being here this morning again with us. Um, and before we begin, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, and uh, we call this an interactive panel discussion for a reason. And if you were at the screening uh, last night, you would know that I'm not the most technologically savvy person, so I'm grateful for folks uh, here to help me with that. And so uh, if you can take a few minutes to take your phone out, uh, and you'll see um, coming shortly the uh, QR codes, or it's on the little lollipop stands out there as well. We're using a, a platform called Slido. So if you're uncomfortable asking a question in, uh, in person uh, with a microphone, certainly send your text uh, or a question uh, our way. And Nicholas and Angeliki will go ahead and uh, send them over to me, and I will do my best to ask all of the questions that we can. Uh, and then uh, we'll do our best to, uh, to answer all the questions, sorry. And then we'll prioritize the folks on the floor first and then go to Slido uh, after. Um, Okay, uh, so I also wanted to say that this session is in English, but uh, it is being recorded and we'll be posting a French version and an English version on our website as well so that it is accessible later on and I'm sure we'll connect that to the conference folks as well so that you can have access to it uh, um, as attendees. Um, now, as always in everything we do and uh, that we ask of everyone in this, uh, in, this uh, in this space to be respectful of others. Uh, we all have different perspectives and part of our work here at the museum is creating a safe uh, space to have the conversations that matter where folks might hold different opinions. And so um, I'll thank you uh, for doing that in advance and, um, and we'll move forward in a good way. The other thing is uh, the museum is open and you might see some tour groups go by. Uh, they might be waving or whatever, wave back if you want to. Uh, but it is important that if you wanna ask a question that you do use the microphone because of the noise and there are folks who may not be able to hear. So please do uh, the, use the microphone even though you think you may have a loud voice. Um, so now without further delay, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Michelle Douglas, who is the Executive Director of the Purge Fund, to start the discussion on the monument and share some inspiration behind the monument project. Michelle. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, my name is Michelle Douglas. I am the executive director of the LGBT Purge Fund. I'm a survivor of the LGBT Purge. It's my honor, it's a joy, it's inspiration for me uh, to join with you all, human rights activists, queer activists, people working in common purpose. You are amazing and I'm so happy to be here with you. Can I start by just acknowledging the beautiful words of Elder Albert McLeod? I've noticed in hearing closely the words that he speaks every time he addresses small in number folks or much larger like we are this morning, he always takes us on a journey. He educates us, he inspires us, compels us, and we also wish, wow, could we speak like Albert McLeod? You are amazing, and thank you very much for your guidance and your love and your passion. We're so honored by everything you've done and uh, acknowledge uh, your leadership and community over so many decades. I I'm just so inspired, Albert McLeod. One of my uh, fun duties this morning is to talk about a really exciting project that is happening in Canada. The LGBT Purge Fund is very pleased to be leading an initiative known as the LGBTQ2 Plus National Monument. What is it? Let me just give you a little bit of background. As a result, of the historic injustice, the shameful period in Canadian history, known now as the LGBT purge. A number of courageous 
survivors from that period, worked with a legal team to bring forward a legal challenge against the Canadian government, seeking reconciliation and a way to bring some measure of justice for those who experienced the devastating harm of the LGBT purge. Here I turn to friends, colleagues, survivors, Martine Roy and Todd Ross, who were the lead uh, representatives along with Alita Sitalik, but many, many hundreds of other living survivors participated in that lawsuit, led by some incredibly special lawyers, including the lead counsel, Douglas Elliott, and you'll hear from him later. One of the things they valued most was trying to find a way towards reconciliation, to find a way to memorialize this period of Canadian history. From the 1950s to the 1990s, we think more than 9,000 people experienced state oppression. These were employees serving their country and they were often humiliated, shamed, fired, certainly discriminated against, and many times worse, sometimes institutionalized, assaulted, sexually assaulted, arrested. And for some, the damage remains, many, most I would say, uh, the damage and the scars from that time remain. But what do you do with that? There's gotta be something that is called for, and many actions were taken as a result of that lawsuit. The LGBT fund, Purge Fund, has uh, launched a major project, and let me just tell you a few things about it, because I, I don't want to be uh, taking up too much time, because we really have some fabulous folks who you're going to want to hear from. Um, the Purge Fund was able to have funds from those who did not live long enough to file a claim in the class action lawsuit. So the funds to support the building of this monument will come from those dollars, right? So it's not government money. This is the, the money, the representative funds that would have gone to survivors had they lived long enough. And what have we done? Well, we've established a, a, an extensive process. We've contacted the community. We established an indigenous circle. We've brought together advisors. And we've also, through surveys and other means, connected with over 5,000 people across this country to talk to us about the vision for this monument, the design for this monument. What are the objectives of the monument? They are these. They will educate. The monument will educate. It will memorialize. It will celebrate. And for sure, it will inspire. You're really going to see that in a minute. What are the guiding principles we've developed? Well, inclusion. Makes sense. Indigeneity. Of course, we have to contend with the injustice and the ongoing uh, problem of colonization. Visibility, we've been invisible for a long time. And also the idea of timelessness, this will stand for all time. And it's for sure worth saying that this is not just a monument to the LGBT purge time. Yes, that's part of it, but it's bigger. And those who were involved in the lawsuit had the dream of saying it will not just mark the, uh, the, the uh, LGBT purge shameful period of history, but really mark the period of discrimination over millennia, really, uh, for uh, experience by the LGBTQ2 plus community. So the process was commenced. We had some incredible design presentations. More than 32 teams submitted to design this national monument. It was an international competition. Well, those 32 teams eventually became five finalists. And after a lengthy process, a jury process, lots of technical analysis, the jury selected one amazing team. And well, I'm pretty excited to say, and you're gonna get to meet them all in a minute, you know, there's something about a, a team from Winnipeg that just makes them incredibly special, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, we know to pay attention when something, you know, design and creativity emerge from the center of this country, an amazing place, the home of the Métis Nation and Treaty One land, and they put forward this extraordinary design. They're gonna talk about it. It's called the Thunderhead. And the beautiful team from Winnipeg is here. They're gonna tell you more about it, but I'm so happy to turn it back to Haran, who's going to introduce them, and then you're gonna spend time with them. I'm so glad you know more about this now. This is your monument. This is our monument. Back to you, Haran. Thanks very much. Note to self, never follow Michelle Douglas. <laughs> um, so I would like to now uh, welcome Liz Reeford, Peter Sampson uh, from Public City, the architecture firm, as well as Shauna Dempsey and Lori Milan, who are artists, to join Elder Albert uh, on the stage. And maybe, uh, if I can have Liz and Shauna join me at the podium. There you go. Hi everybody, uh, this is, thank you Michelle for that amazing <laughs> intro, and to Albert as well. Um, this is actually the first time we presented this monument in person to anybody, um, so this is amazing to be able to do this in Winnipeg. Uh, <laughs> uh, we are so proud to have been chosen to design the National LGBTQ2 Plus Monument not just for our team, but for our families, my children, and for all of their friends, who are gonna grow up in a world that promises to provide acceptance, love, and understanding. I get emotional every single time I talk about this. <laughs> I don't think it's ever gonna go away. This monument is about building the kind of world we want to live in and the country we believe in. It will be the first national LGBTQ2 plus monument in the world. Yeah, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Thank you to the LGBT Purge Fund, the jury and its advisors, and everyone else who fought so hard for this monument and for this moment in history. Quick introduction to our team. Um, my name is Liz Reeford. I'm the principal landscape architect of Public City. I have the pleasure to be collaborating with artist Shauna Dempsey, who's joining me up here today, and Laurie Milan, yes, they're amazing. Indigenous and Two-Spirit advisor Albert McLeod, we're so lucky to have him. Uh, we're also joined today uh, by the other owner and principal architect of Public City, my partner Peter Sampson. And a big shout out to um, all of our team at Public City who is working so hard on this with us. We were the only all-Canadian team shortlisted in the competition, and we all live and work in Winnipeg, which we are also super proud of. <laughs> um, and we're just so excited to share our design with you today in Winnipeg at the Canadian Museum of Human Rights. So as you can imagine, it was a challenge to design a monument that's relevant to all LGBTQ2 plus people. We've got different identities, we have different histories, but we do share some common characteristics. Persistent endurance in the struggle for basic human rights and the strength to pursue life, sex, and love to build families and communities despite societal hostility. In the early stages of the design process, Lori recalled the nearly indescribable, expansive feeling we've all had when we marched surrounded by hundreds or thousands or danced at pride or stood up for an idea. She started trying to sketch something that reflected that complicated energy of rage and righteousness, pleasure and power, and landed on the image of a thundercloud an embodiment of energy expanding and transmuting, an essential natural force. Albert taught us that in indigenous understandings of the natural world, thunderclouds are where the thunderers live. These amorphous spirits, thunderbirds, 
are connectors between the realms of sky and earth who cleanse the land with rain, lightning and wind, and begin to set things right. This idea, a powerful cloud that can contain divine sparks of desire, anger, and inspiration, and begin to set things right, is what inspired our design. We created various models exploring the notion that despite the imposing and monumental of nature of a thunderhead, it's essentially vapor, it's kind of nothing. It's an uncontainable material. Um, so we were then faced with trying to figure out how to design a monument around something that, like this that's always changing and something that couldn't really be defined. The monument is a void left by the imprint of a towering thunderhead. A seemingly impermeable and monumental column has been disrupted and defeated by an internal and expanding mass of energy. The imprint of the thunderhead breaks through the column. And then, of course, we had to also incorporate disco balls into the design. <laughs> so the interior is clad in a mosaic of mirrored tile, which will refract light and create a monument that is always changing and always dynamic. Thunderhead seeks to capture both the turmoil of LGBTQ2 plus history and celebration, joy, and hope. The interior, the space that the cloud would have occupied, holds the memory of all of those who we have lost, all of the lives that ended too soon through the effects of the purge, including fear, suicide, addiction, the AIDS pandemic, and violence. We are mindful that it must represent all of these losses. Many victims of the purge did not live to see this day. This is a site plan of the park and monument with the site outlined in yellow. Uh, the site is at the elbow of Wellington Street and the Portage Bridge, not Portage for Winnipeggers. <laughs> we have to be careful of that. <laughs> uh, on the Ottawa River. Uh, to orient everyone further, if you're not familiar with the site, it's right between uh, the Library and Archives Building and the National Navy Monument. Thunderhead is in the column at the center of, their, of the screen here, yep, shown with the yellow arrow. There are two major zones of the park. The green open area to the southwest of Thunderhead is a sloping lawn wrapped by a path that leads to the monument. This area will include seating, interpretive material, and the main gathering area for large events. The area to the northeast of Thunderhead includes a healing circle with a fire, a medicinal garden, more intimate seating areas, and an orchard, a fruit orchard, of course. What you are seeing today is the original concept design, which we're working on now, further developing um, as we start working on this project. One of the first elements our team agreed upon was a stage, a space that gives voice to. This is an acknowledgement of the essential role that the arts have always played in resistance and building the LGBTQ2 community. Anyone can occupy this space, can take up this space, can stand up and say, I am. The monument draws upon symbols of nature and culture. The thundercloud is powerful, rising up as queer communities have risen up. Although many of us were called unnatural and deviant, the use of an image from nature asserts that we are a valuable part of the web of life. At the same time, the mirrorball-like interior references queer culture and our fight for human rights. By this, we mean the thousands of mirrored tiles inside the thundercloud, which will encourage us to reflect upon not only the many lives changed or lost forever during a dark period of Canadian history, but as well those individuals and identities that comprise our country's diverse LGBTQ2 community now and for generations to come. We respect that this monument will be located on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Anishinaabe Algonquin Nation. The curved path leads to the monument and orients the visitor toward the Ottawa River, 
the historic trade route of the Algonquin Anishinaabe, and one of many waterways across this land that form the connective tissue between and within indigenous nations. On the north side of Thunderhead is a healing circle and fire pit ringed by stones contributed by two spirit elders from Canada's 13 territories and provinces and symbolizing the 13 moons of each year. There's also a garden beside the healing circle where sage, sweet grass and other plants that are used for medicine and healing will grow. This view also shows the approach to Thunderhead when entering the site from the north if you were walking along the river from Parliament Hill. All of the national monuments in Ottawa should be 10% queer to reflect us. But they're not. We wanted to create one that's 110% queer. <laughs> this monument has to be 110% ours, an identifiably queer space that welcomes everyone 365 days of the year. This monument has to be a highly visible symbol of how we survived, asserting that we are proudly, unapologetically here and we're going to be invisible no longer. Thank you very much for being here today and um, I just want to thank you on behalf of our entire team and we would love to now um, speak with you and answer any questions. Thank you. So do we have any questions? I'm looking at my Slido technology piece here. Uh, Nicholas, Angelique, are you ready for this? <laughs> um, are there any questions off from the floor? I have uh, uh, Maya or Savannah with microphones to come to you. The challenge with a very thorough presentation is you don't leave room for questions. <laughs> <laughs> any questions, thoughts, comments, compliments? Yes. Um, Savannah or, yeah. The mic's on his way, just over here. Thank you, Savannah. Thank you. Um, I didn't really have a question. I just wanted to see Savannah run across the room. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Savannah. Um, this is a very, very beautiful uh, presentation. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of your hard work, all of you. Um, you had mentioned the, the idea, one of the driving forces behind this is being um, recognizing indigeneity and recognizing our indigenous kin across Turtle Island. And I guess what I'm curious to know, I, I don't know if it's like a, a full on question, but um, myself and my, my fellow Two-Spirit kin um, over the past couple of years have been really fighting our, and pushing um, the idea of not tacking on Two-Spirit people at the end um, of the queer community um, as Indigenous people have always been just an afterthought for many, many years. So um, I, I think about that when, when, we, when something this great comes up and we call it like LGBTQ or Q2 and then add two at the end instead of 2S LGBTQQIA+. Because two-spirit people are indigenous people and we are the first people of these lands and, um, and we should be acknowledged um, as such. Thank you. Thank you. Did, um, Michelle, did you want to respond to that comment or anyone on the podium? You know, I, I think that is a question I think you did. I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, it's working. Um, yeah, that's a perfect question for us, and it's the challenge for us. We struggle with acronyms uh, and trying to be fully inclusive. The idea of timelessness is our challenge to fully appreciate how the monument's name will evolve, how our stories will evolve. Your question is a challenge back to us to say, how can we? Uh, see what's happening in the world and make those adjustments. I know that conversation is very much alive. 
Um, we're going back to, to uh, rethink, I think, the name of this and really honor what we want to do, which is honor our two-spirit people, um, uh, acknowledge colonization's role in our history, and I think that per presents the perfect um, a challenge for us to look at changing the name. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Um, so for folks at the panel, oh, Albert, sorry. It's on Albert, I think. Yeah. Check, check, sibilance, sibilance. <laughs> okay, yeah, just the whole thing about no, naming no, and uh, renaming, and I believe for indigenous people, uh, self-naming and renaming is an act of liberation, an act of decolonization and reconciliation. I think all of the First Nations in Canada have dropped their colonial name to an indigenous right, place just name. A thing, but just right? to watch That's for. part of you know, that decolonization and reconciliation yeah. process. So indigenous, indigenous languages that describe yeah. places right. is really a part of Canadian history, particularly Manitoba, which means where the spirit exists in Cree and Ojibwe, and Winnipeg, which means murky water. So. It is the legacy of our colonial history, and we are all speaking indigenous languages every day in Canada, but you don't know that, right? So it's that consciousness level. Regarding the renaming of indigenous people around the two-spirit, and I do see it as a spirit name that came to us in 1990. As part of our reconciliation with that history that uh, Jordi Einstar mentioned, that predates colonization. And we know there's over 156 terms or words that exist in various languages across North America, and as well as our delegation from South America, there are also those terms and words and names in their cultures. So the 32-year journey of raising that consciousness with the broader LGBT community, as well as governmental institutions, whether they were federal, provincial, or territorial, has been that sort of, well, gay liberation began in the 1960s uh, in the US, and that's not true. So it really is, there was a group of activists in that era uh, but there was queer people of color every inch of the way, right? And some of them were leaders. So that whole um, understanding of the power of English in the colonial context on how it establishes power and privilege and access. And uh, when we dropped the name Two Spirit into the mix in 1990, there was pushback that said, well, now what? You know, do we have to add to the acronym? That's so hard. You know, and, uh, and let me tell you, it's taken 30 years for the broader LGBTQ2 community to come to an understanding that the indigenous people are the first queers of the America. The Americas, right? <laughs> and some of these words and names are thousands of years old. You know, even before the conception of Henry VIII. So think about that, right? So it's not that competition, it's raising awareness. And that spirit is about, you know, in the broader movement, it was really about politics and equal rights, same-sex marriage. Not much discussion about spiritual essence, spiritual being. And I want to say that as a queer people, of indig of, uh, indigenous queer people, we brought that spirituality back into the movement, right? And we didn't bring one, we bought two. We bought a spare, you know? <laughs> so yeah, and, and I know with the national, the national Apology in 2017 and the establishment of the LGBTQ2 Secretariat, the two is at the end, and it was a numeral. So we got a numeral, anywho. Um, and it is institutional, and Canada's a baby country. It's 150 years old. It takes time to learn. And slowly, maybe, that, ac that acronym may migrate to the front. It all depends on the prime minister and the office and the powers that be that Canada did not start when Canada, you know, the settlers arrived. We know that. You know, indigenous people have been here thousands of years. The Basque have been here. The Vikings have been here. And so... So just that idea of state 
and, and how the state wants to be represented as a colonial one. And really that, that with the LGBTQ2 Secretariat or the monument, that migration of that too to the front is a process. And it may not happen readily, but hopefully it will happen. Thank you. Thanks, Albert. Um, I, I've been told that we're 10 minutes over. I'm not very good at moderating time, but what is time? Um, <laughs> but I just have a couple of quick questions for, uh, for, um, for some folks here. And I'll lump it up into uh, um, a couple of, or I'll lump it up into one. So uh, the question was, when, it, when will it be built? How many people can it hold? And were there any challenges that you encountered um, in, in uh, where the monument will be placed? or deciding or getting permits and things like that? Uh, I, I can answer s some of those questions. Um, we, we were tasked with, with providing space for large gatherings such as Pride. So the lawn in front of the monument will accommodate, I think it was 2,000 people. Um, inside the monument and the stage, you know, we can we can pack it in. Uh, <laughs> so we want, we want to see full bands and big drag shows and chorus lines on that stage. Um, the, some of the challenges were that part of the piece of land is a flood zone, but we're from Winnipeg, so. <laughs> and of course, weather, making this durable. Uh, but again, we're from Winnipeg. Uh, so the construction materials and techniques are going to be very important to ensure its longevity. So that's what we're working on now. And uh, it will be open in 2025. Um, so which seems like a long time away, but there's a lot of work to do between now and when it opens. Um, it'll start to be constructed about a year before uh, it opens. So. Any to add to that? And just a quick uh, question that I forgot to ask in that lump uh, of questions is, um, will there be lighting to represent the co our communities, like the flags and things like that, because there was nothing um, sort of presented in the design in terms of colors? Would that be an option there? The lighting is a huge part of the design. Um, we are working with a lighting designer. Um, we know especially in winter that's going to be even more important. but. I think there's so much opportunity to bring color into the design through the lighting, um, and that's what we're really focusing on uh, now. Sure. Yeah. Well, I think. Uh, oh, okay. No. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's lots of questions. Okay. Can I take one more from the floor? Um, sharp. Oh, I'll take two. Sharp. I'm sorry, folks. Forgive me. Love me. Sharp, and, uh, and then I'll come to you. Run, damn it. <laughs> I actually have a question about uh, maintenance, uh, not just of kind of the grounds, but we have to acknowledge this is going to be a queer monument. You're going to need a big graffiti removal budget. <laughs> That's just a reality. We got people in Ottawa who piss on a cenotaph. So what do you think is going to happen to our monument? How do we manage that? How do we navigate that? Um, because for me, as a veteran and a purge survivor, this monument has the same weight as that cenotaph. Yeah. Especially when, you know, Michelle said that the money for this monument comes from the ones who, whose voices can't be heard anymore whether it was because of the shame or violence or whatever. So that will be and is sacred ground. So how do we protect that? Because it's really important. If it stands there and isn't protected, then what have we actually done? As part of the budget for the project, there is ongoing maintenance. And the National Capital Commission takes that role very seriously and maintain all of the monuments in Ottawa to the same standard and, and will maintain ours as well. Uh, one of the things we're working on is creating surfaces that are as uh, damage proof as possible.
Thank you. Yes. Okay, I guess it's my turn. Um, hello. Um, thank you for letting me ask my question, and thank you um, to the previous question asker for being here and being visible. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm also a Winnipegger, so I'm very glad to see uh, Winnipeg represented. And I actually had a misconception. I thought this monument was going to be in Winnipeg, so uh, I guess anyone up for a road trip in 2025? <laughs> um, yeah, sounds awesome. Um, so my question, uh, I also work in the museum world and especially in Winnipeg, we've heard last year and July 1st of the tearing down of Queen the Queen Victoria Monument for Canada Day. So, and the questions of monuments and how we've been kind of seeing them being represented and torn down in that history uh, and those conversations in the museum world and in society being taken place. So I just wanted to see how you guys are kind of taking that into account as you were creating this monument, what kind of questions you were asking and answering in terms of what's the future gonna look like for this monument. Uh, I know you've already addressed a little bit of like changing the names and such and that, but uh, life is always evolving and who knows what's going to happen, especially with our community, hopefully great things, but uh, I just wanted to see what you can comment on that. Thank you. I, I think you touched on all the questions that were on our mind for sure during the process. Um, I, it, so we intentionally avoided, well, first of all, we don't have singular images or icons that we were going to build a, a monument around we needed to dig a little deeper and find something metaphorical to be the center and something that is a part of everyone's life somehow or another and can perhaps relate to as a metaphor. We really want to focus on building a space for the community now and the future to occupy. It's not for us to determine what that looks like, but to create a varied set of discrete areas within a, a park-like setting, as well as a whole vision for a community to fill. Um, it's really up to you folks, and that's, that's our way around it. I mean, there's, there, are, you know, there, are other, there will be challenges for sure, and especially when they're putting together text to, to describe the community, there, there'll be lots of challenges, but we're very focused on making a space for the community to honor the past and create a future. Thank you all so much. I'm actually not going to look at the audience anymore. I'm just going to say thank you <laughs> so much for being here and sharing your uh, sharing this presentation with us. I'm sure there's plenty of opportunities for more talks and emails and conversations with you. So thank you so much and a round of applause for folks here. Thank you. Yeah. Um, if I can please have uh, Douglas Elliott, Sven Robinson, Reva Harrison join me on stage while I talk a little bit about the, uh, the Purge. Um, in brief, it's between the 1950s, and this is something I took off their website. In brief, it's uh, between the 1950s and mid-1990s, LGBT members of the Canadian Armed Forces, the RCMP, and the Federal Public Service were systematically discriminated, discriminated against, harassed, and often fired as a matter of policy and sanctioned practice in what came to be known as the LGBT purge. People were followed, interrogated, abused, and traumatized by their own government. In 2016, survivors of the LGBT purge launched a nationwide class action lawsuit against the Canadian government, and a historic settlement was reached in June 2018, as well as compensating survivors, and this settlement allocated funds for reconciliation and memorialization measures. Uh, the LGBT Purge Fund is a non-profit corporation that was set up to manage these funds, and the board is composed of six members and includes LGBT Purge survivors, clash action plaintiffs, and a, um, and a representative of the legal team that challenged the Canadian government. It is my privilege to welcome Douglas Elliott, Sven Robinson, and Reva Harrison to the panel. I'm going to go have a seat and read you the, uh, their bios. I think this thing turns on, I get to be like Britney Spears for a moment. Um, so for you, <laughs> they don't pay me enough for that. Uh, <laughs> So for Doug, Doug, Doug West Elliott is a partner in Cambridge LLP and led counsel for the class action. He is an expert on 2S LGBTQ plus rights, constitutional law and class action lawsuits, as well as the lead author on the Just Society Report 
Douglas is well known for his work on landmark cases, including Hislop versus Canada, largest class action concerning 2S LGBTQ plus rights here in Canada to date. Um, that's an abbreviated version. I read a long one last night, so if you didn't come last night, you missed it. Um, Sven Robinson served as federal NDP member of parliament from 1979 to 2004 as Canada's first openly gay MP coming out in 1988. He was a member of the historic 1981 Constitution Committee and the 1985 Equality Rights Committee. Uh, Sven also worked closely with many purge survivors, including Michelle Douglas, and was appointed to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's advisory council on the 2017 apology. He has been he has been contracted by the LGBT purge to fund to review documents released pursuant to the class action lawsuit and to write the history of the purge. Uh, and Reva Harrison is the Vice President, External Relations and Community Engagement at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Um, Reva's lifelong commitment to human rights and social justice has included advocacy for the 2S LGBTQ plus community. She was a member of a team that advanced same-sex adoption rights in Manitoba and part of the executive that worked with the Red River College, now known as RRC Polytech Students Association, to create a new resource center for 2S LGBTQ plus students on campus. As a journalist, Harrison received two Harrison, Reva received two <laughs> prestigious Manitoba Human Rights Journalism Awards. Um, and I know that each of you have prepared a little talk, and that's what I was going to read next. Um, so Doug, you have a distinguished legal career fighting for human rights, most notably the 2S LGBTQ plus rights, and you were instrumental in leading the charge that led to the purge settlement, apology, and the work we're doing today to build an exhibit and a monument. What do you hope the monument and exhibit will achieve in our struggle to build a more inclusive community? Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's, uh, that's a great question. Um, and you want no, me to I think I messed up. He wants, he Again. Want, you got the wrong question. I got the wrong question. Yeah. You got the wrong question. Everyone got 10 minutes to prepare, and I think you were going to talk about how yeah. we got here. You want me to get, yes. get, talk Where about we were how, and we how we got here. Okay. I'm, Sorry. A a apparently, Sven <laughs> is uncomfortable with me on his left. It's the first time it's ever happened. Uh, so, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, isn't it? It's so nice to be all together in person, finally. Uh, we're social beings, and uh, we all miss that social connection. I want to say I'm very happy to be here on behalf of the LGBT Purge Fund, but I'm also here with our beloved elders, Steve and Isabel Miwoski, from our neighbors in Ginabajing, and uh, with our team from Elliott Lake Pride and Northern Ontario Pride Network. Uh, so, uh, how did we get here? Well, um, I want to, you've heard a little bit about the purge, but some of you may be puzzled about how it all happened. If you want to know all of the details, come to the museum exhibit that's going to open here in 2024. You're going to hear lots more about it. Uh, but let me just tell you in a nutshell how all of this craziness got going and how we ended up here. Um, back in the 40s, the Red Scare started in 1945 when Igor, Igor Kuzenko defected in Ottawa and revealed the fact that there were communist spies everywhere in North America. It was a great wake-up call to Canadians and there started an atmosphere of paranoia that there were communist spies lurking everywhere who were going to uh, destroy our world, in fact, through atomic war. Um, later on, and I think this was in part because of Kinsey's revelations about the fact that homosexuality was much more common than people had thought in his famous reports. Uh, somehow, in the 1950s, uh, the Americans got this idea, uh, and it started in the American Congress with a committee called the Hui Committee, that communists were homosexuals and homosexuals were <laughs> communists, and that you could that homosexuals represented a threat to national security, and that was for several reasons. First of all, we were criminals, we were mentally ill, uh, we had weak moral characters, and of course, because of all of those things, we were subject to blackmail, and therefore we could not be trusted in separate in sensitive government positions, and a witch hunt started in the United States to 
identify, interrogate, and fire all of the gay people working in, for the American federal government. Well, Canada very quickly got on the bandwagon. The RCMP told the federal government that the Americans would not share military intelligence with us if we could not be trusted, and if we had homosexuals working for us, we could not be trusted. So the witch hunt spread to all of the allies of the United States, and it intensified through the 1950s and 1960s. Michelle mentioned a figure of 9,000. Actually, Sven's research has indicated uh, that the federal government was actually going out and spying on the LGBT community at large because they wanted to prevent any of us from coming to work for the uh, federal government, and they also wanted to make sure that they could get the names of the people working in the federal government from people in the community. One time there were 30,000 files about people in our community held by the RCMP. Although the Red Scare, uh, by the time I was a kid growing up in the 60s, by that time the Red Scare had died down in the United States, and in fact in Canada, it was really viewed laughably. Senator McCarthy was viewed as a joke. He had died uh, a pathetic alcoholic and possibly a closeted homosexual, actually. Um, but the, although the Red Scare had died down, the, what the uh, Americans call the Lavender Scare continued. By the way, the LGBT purge is not a term that was used back then. They didn't use such polite language. They called this deviance. Um, homosexuals was the nicest word that they used. Um, LGBT purge is a term that I coined subsequently to try and come up with a, a term that was simple and worked well in French and English to describe what happened. Uh, this policy continued in a very typically Canadian polite below the radar way, uh, right through until the late 1960s when uh, the changes in the criminal code caused people to rethink it. But actually, the Canadian Armed Forces and the RCMP doubled down at that time and made it very clear that even if it wasn't a criminal offence anymore, it was unacceptable conduct in the Canadian Armed Forces and in the RCMP. And that policy continued of hunting down gays and lesbians in the Canadian Armed Forces and the RCMP until 1992 when a brave young lesbian stood up to the Canadian government, took them to court and won, and that woman was Michelle Douglas 30 years ago. Now, some of you may be wondering why Michelle didn't launch a class action lawsuit. And believe me, if you know Michelle, you'll know that if she could have done it, she would have. <laughs> we, we didn't have class actions back when Michelle brought her case. Uh, and there was, uh, so when Michelle won, there was some relief for others like her in the sense that they could now get promotions and so on. There was, a, there was not just something for Michelle, she insisted on an end to this policy across the federal government. And so she did a lot of good for a lot of people. But the people like her who had been harmed, the, the, the survivors, the walking wounded, did not get compensation from the federal government. Uh, people like Martine Roy and Todd Ross. So fast forward to 2016, and I met Martin and Todd. By this time, there were class actions, and I had won the first constitutional class action, the Hislop case. Uh, and Martin and Todd agreed that we should pursue a class action uh, for the survivors, and we successfully negotiated a landmark settlement that was approved by the federal court in 2018 for $145 million, the largest LGBT settlement in the world. Now in the Hislop case, we, the Supreme Court of Canada ruled that dead people don't have charter rights, so anyone who had died before that case went to trial got nothing. We were very determined that the, peop that the government of Canada was not going to profit from those who had died, and we insisted that money be set aside that represented their suffering, 
that would be used for the benefit of the community. And that is the money that has gone to the LGBT Purge Fund. We had to determine a number of projects that we were going to do as part of the work of the LGBT Purge Fund. One of them was the monument that you've heard, and that's something that's really important for people to realize. Every penny for the construction of that monument is a gift from the survivors of the LGBT purge and to those people from the spirit realm that Albert <coughs> McLeod mentioned, a gift to our country and to our future so that we will always remember the struggle for equality of our community. The second project that we wanted to have, anybody who knows me knows that I'm a history buff. It's, one of, it's the part of the truly nerdy side of me. Uh, my mother always said that I wanted to live in a museum. Uh, one thing we know, whenever we screen the movie The Fruit Machine that we showed last night, I often I ask people, put up your hands, any of you who knew this story, before you watch this movie. And it's always surprising to me that usually about 90% of the audience, often many people from my own LGBT community, no clue, didn't know anything about it, never knew this happened. And I think that's, there's a danger that that ignorance could increase over time because we haven't yet learned well in our community to do the kind of intergenerational teaching that somebody like Isabel Miawaski is expert at in her community. We have a lot to learn from Indigenous people in that regard. So we're very determined that we wanted to educate Canadians about this shameful episode in our history. It's one thing I think that distinguishes Canada from some other countries like the United States and Japan who would prefer to sweep the bad stuff under the carpet and not talk about it. I think that Canadians are learning that uh, well now that the best way to deal with the ugly parts of our history is to confront them and to face them. Uh, and so we decided we would have a museum exhibit. I have to give credit to uh, my opponent in the case, uh, Christine Moore, who is the, leads the Department of Justice, who is a proud Winnipegger. I, I'm not sure there is any other kind of Winnipegger, actually. Uh, and she was very determined that this museum exhibit was going to be at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights in Winnipeg. Uh, and it, she was kind of pushing on an open door with me because uh, I think this is a fantastic museum. And uh, when I came to the museum, I was painfully aware of the fact that uh, the LGBT content at that time was pretty scarce and it was diffuse. It was really hard to see in the museum. So, uh, and, and that notwithstanding that I know that Albert McLeod, for example, had been banging on the door for years trying to get them to, to get that content in here. So we agreed to do it uh, here. The uh, exhibit is being funded. It's a very serious exhibit. You're going to hear more about it from Riva. But the LGBT Purge Fund has committed over $2 million to this exhibit. It's a very serious spend. I would be remiss since I said I think Canadians do the right thing by confronting the difficult parts of it, our history to, uh, if I didn't mention the difficult part of our history with the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. After we had committed to this project here, we were all shocked to learn that there had been incidents of racism at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and shamefully there had been incidents of homophobia where uh, the, the limited LGBT content had been covered up at the request of religious schools. Um, I'll be candid with you, uh, we at the LGBT Purge Fund felt betrayed. We really did. We thought we knew the people here, we trusted them, and we couldn't believe that uh, we were learning about this for the first time and that these terrible things had happened. And we had to really think about whether we wanted to continue with the museum or not. Uh, eventually, we decided to carry on, and we decided to carry on for two reasons. One, I'll be candid with you, uh, we didn't know whether there weren't hidden problems like that at other museums. Uh, 
But secondly, and more importantly, uh, we were very impressed with how the museum responded. They took it very seriously. Uh, they understood the importance of visibility of LGBT folks. One of our principal demands was that they started listening to Albert McLeod. And you've seen Albert everywhere. Albert has been the most visible person <laughs> at this all event. So he, the centrality of Two-Spirit uh, issues was vital to us, and it was clear to us that the museum was taking that seriously. And uh, I'm going to take some credit for Haran and Revo working at the museum now, because we insisted that they started putting some of our people in senior management at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. <laughs> And these aren't token appointments, uh, folks. These are really talented people who happen to be members of our community, uh, and we're really delighted to be uh, working with them. I also want to mention to all of, two things to all of you folks from local pride organizations. Uh, the LGBT Purge Fund has a community grant program. If you want to do something especially connected to the LGBT Purge Fund, uh, the history of the purge or uh, educating people about uh, LGBT history, please uh, reach out to us with your ideas and we will consider them. Uh, we don't have a ton of money for those projects, but we have some. Uh, and we're only around for a limited period of time. The other thing I want you to know is that in addition to the big, and it's going to be big and beautiful exhibit here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, we are have built into our program a small traveling exhibit because we know the people, especially the people who went to the Canadian Armed Forces, and I want to salute all the survivors of the LGBT purger who are here, and, and thank you for your service to our country. But you know, th these folks by and large, you know, Todd came from St. Stephen, New Brunswick, Wayne, joined the RCMP from Drumheller, Alberta. You know, these people came, by and large, from small-town Canada. So we think it's really important to get that message out to places like Drumheller and St. Stephen and Elliott Lake, and not just in big cities like Winnipeg. So we're going to have a traveling exhibit that's going to be going around to various communities across Canada. And if that's going to work, we're going to need partnerships with local pride organizations across this great country. So please, if you're keen on this, reach out to us. We want to work with you, and we want every Canadian to learn the story of the LGBT purge. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Douglas. Um, Sven, please don't go anywhere. <laughs> and now that I've gotten my notes back on track, we could go back on track. I think we're doing good. So Sven, could you, could you take us uh, on a bit of a behind the scenes through the LGBTQ plus document collection process, please? Okay, I lost control. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Haran, and um, it is an incredible honor and privilege to be able to join you this morning on the unceded Treaty 1 territory, the homeland of the Métis Nation. And I want to thank uh, the museum, I want to thank uh, the uh, Purge Fund for the privilege that I have, having been invited to embark on this journey to review the documents that have been shared by the government over the course of the last four years uh, as part of the settlement, the class action settlement that, uh, that Doug referred to. The government made a commitment four years ago that Canada has searched likely sources of documentation and is committed to telling the story of the purge fully and fairly. I've reviewed a little over 11,000 pages about 10% of those have been blacked out because of access to information exemptions, and we're fighting that. About 2,500 documents. And they reveal 
an incredible story. A journey and a story of pain, of hope, of courage, of incredible resilience, and in a part of our history that must be shared with all Canadians. As Doug mentioned, I've also got the privilege of building on the seminal work that was done by Patricia and Gary in their landmark work on the Canadian War on Queers and updating and, and, and using these documents to help to tell that story. And part of the story that I want to share with you this morning in the time that I have is, is just to give you a glimpse from some of the documents that I viewed of what took place, the shame, the horror, the evil of the purge. And also to remind you that the purge wasn't just about those who were fired. And I join with Doug in paying tribute to those survivors, a number of, a, of whom are with us today. But it's also important to remember that the scars of the purge and the evil of the purge extended far beyond those who were fired. Many of them were in the category that was called permitted to resign. Because of course many of them, when they were confronted with the evidence, simply were given the option of, of leaving. Others who looked forward with excitement to serving their country, whether it's in the military, the RCMP, or public service, others never had that chance. People like Todd Ross, who, who was a star cadet, imagine, had it been known that he was gay at the time that he joined the military, he'd never been able to realize that dream. So the scars are borne by those who, who the, to whom the doors were, were closed. They were borne as well, so powerfully, by those who lived in fear. They were victims of the purge as well. Those who stayed were victims of the purge. And many of them, of course, resorted to drugs and alcohol. It was a, a time in which people were afraid that, they would be dis that their identity would be disclosed. The late 50s, for example, one of the documents that I read demonstrated that uh, during the, this is 1961, during the past two and a half years, we have been engaged in a concentrated investigation, mainly in the Ottawa area, to identify all homosexuals employed in or by the federal government. Imagine, this was the task that the RCMP had undertaken. And as part of that, they forced people to name names. And this is another document from the RCMP which referred to the people that were interrogated and they said, the same character trait, which is an innate desire to talk, they described it as. My partner would agree with that, by the way. Um, <laughs> this same character trait makes them generally voluble sources of information on other homosexuals. We have found that the majority of homosexuals whom we've interviewed have been most cooperative, except those who sought legal counsel or who were coached by other uncooperative homosexuals. But tragically, many people had to, did give names because they thought, well, first there was a legal obligation to do that, and secondly, um, they were told that this was to protect Canada from subversion. The reality, of course, is that there was not a single instance of a gay or lesbian person who was ever found to be disloyal to our country. And yet, this was the, the excuse that was given. Um, the, um, the other ceiling that happened, the lavender ceiling, I was talking with Mark Berlin uh, yesterday about this. The other impact of the purge, of course, too, was that um, in many cases, people were denied promotions. They were sidelined, dead-ended. External affairs was, was one of the worst departments in that regard. Um, there's a, a couple of documents that, that really, you just sort of shake your head. This was a, an external affairs, senior external affairs official talking about why we can't have homosexuals in, the, uh, in external affairs. Generally, we do not want our ambassadors wearing lipstick and rouge, at least not abroad. On the other hand, what are we to think of an ambassadress 
who does not wear lipstick or rouge. Right? I mean, shocking. Um, and then, but they did have some, they, they had some exceptions. You know, they, in a moment of generosity, they said, well, no, we may not have to fire all homosexuals in external affairs because they said there are some positions which are of a non-sensitive nature and non-rotational category. If we're sure that the position will never have any security concerns, consideration could be given to employing a homosexual if the individual is otherwise a responsible person and a desirable candidate. To illustrate, positions such as those relating to interior decorating could <laughs> fall within this category. So that was, that was external affairs. And that was the kind of approach that they had. Um, Doug mentioned the number of 30,000. That number of 30,000, by the way, was not um, uh, an ancient number back in the 50s or 60s. That number of 30,000, by the way, uh, was, in fact, from 1972. And the um, uh, Privy Council Office was very excited about this 30,000 fi files on what they called sexual deviates because had they been able to um, identify exactly where they're located but by, with computers, they said this would serve management in alerting them to undesirable concentrations and thus security risks in any given department. So, Now, one other element that I wanted to just share with you was the investigations that took place. I talked about evil. And one of the most, one of the examples that will be seared in my memory always was a document that uh, referred to an investigation of a very senior officer in Calgary. And this guy was suspected of being uh, gay. And so what they did was that they got a private, somebody who reported him, to entrap him. This was a handsome young private, and the private you know, uh, agreed to meet with him at his apartment, the officer. But before he did that, here's what the uh, report, the investigation report, of the military, military police said. He was given a bottle of fluorescent detection compound and requested to go to the washroom and apply a small amount of it to his privates. Other, afterwards, his hands were checked and secured until no trace of the compound he had applied to his privates could be detected. He then went up to the apartment of the officer while the military police stayed downstairs knocked on the door, went inside, they made love, and when they were finished, banging on the door. The military police came in, they put his hands, this is from the report, we asked him to show his hands and examine them under the UV lamp. Very distinct points of fluorescence were found in the palms and fingers of both hands. When we informed him of the meaning of the, these marks, he became very despondent and incoherent. This is evil. And these were the kind of investigations, spying on bars, reading love letters. The documents are so poignant and powerful about what happened. So, the documents demonstrate the investigations, the homophobia, the incredible homophobia that took place at, at the most senior levels, but there are also stories of the political journey that took place. In 1985, for example, after the Charter of Rights came into force, um, I had the honor of serving on a, a special committee on equality rights that had to look at what, is, what does this mean, Section 15 of the Charter. And that committee, the, the Prime Minister agreed that my bill, 85, to include sexual orientation in the Human Rights Act would be part of the hearings. Well, that committee, five conservatives, one liberal, and myself, held hearings across the country, including, by the way, some amazing hearings here in Winnipeg, which were transformational. Some of you may have known of one of the trailblazers in our community, Chris Vogel, who spoke for the Oscar Wilde Memorial Society to our committee. Or a late night, midnight, confidential hearing in Toronto with Wayne Davis, who's here with us today, who served for 17 years in the RCMP and told us the story of being drummed out because he was gay. And I tell you, every member of that committee was in tears that night. Well, the committee unanimously recommended support for my bill. 
The government in 1986 agreed, amazingly, that there should be no discrimination based on sexual orientation. But then, the military fought back. Eric Nielsen was the Minister of National Defense, and the Chief of Defense Staff, General Theriot, fought back, and they won. By 1987, by 1987, the Minister of National Defense had said, okay, um, whatever the commitment the government may have made, we are going to continue this policy. There'll be two slight changes. We'll take away the requirement that you have to rat on people, and it has to be based on actual homosexual activity and not just propensity, as the policy had said previously. Um, but the policy was going ahead until, in the middle of 1987, the Minister of Justice, Raina Titian, said, hold on a second, I'm not going to allow this. You're not doing this because it's in breach of the Charter. So, that stopped it temporarily. They put a freeze on what happened. People were in limbo. When their contract came to an end, they were kicked out. But then Raina Titian left, and there was a new Minister of Justice. And in 1989, the military was very excited. They had a new order called CFAO 1936, and they were moving forward until, and this is the final story I want to tell you, because the documents for the first time tell us a true story of what stopped not just the military, but the politicians who were determined to continue these policies, these evil policies of discrimination. In 1989, a young officer that we've already been introduced to, Michelle Douglas, sec second lieutenant Michelle Douglas, challenged the policies of the Canadian military. She fought back. She came to see me, a lawyer named Clayton Ruby, and this amazing woman took on the military. She was removed from her post but I want to just share with you uh, one description of her from her base commander after she was removed, who said this, in spite of the apparent injustice she has suffered, she has performed her duties as a protocol officer with great zeal, tremendous energy and dedication, and sincere loyalty to myself and the Canadian forces. Her overall performance has truly been exceptional, one of the three best junior officers I've ever worked with. Yet, the system has not paid her for her untiring efforts and exceptional hard work. So what did they do? They agreed to promote her, and then they fired her the next day. Well, she fought back. And listen to how this happened. The Department of Justice had to examine her because they were defending this new policy. And they examined her under oath, and here's what they said. This is the justice lawyer. And all these documents now we've seen for the first time. She was a very impressive witness. And the facts set out in the documents and elaborated on by her point to extremely shabby treatment of her by the SIU. As a result of the examination, we can confidently say that this plaintiff will make an excellent witness at trial and that a judge is likely to be very impressed with her and quite sympathetic to her case. And then they went on. These are the lawyers for the Department of Justice, documents, by the way, that we weren't supposed to have. Um, balanced against the very real probability of the court finding against the Canadian forces is the damage which trial publicity is likely to do to credibility of the forces. There's a very real possibility that those who are called upon to testify on behalf of the forces will simply be made to look foolish. So this woman had them on the run, right? She had them on the run. But, but, look, I mean, the, 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 the entire weight of the military establishment and senior members of the Conservative Caucus and ministers was still against this woman. So, more. The next year, middle of 1991, justice came back and, and, and said, look, we've got a problem here. We don't want to take this case to court. The facts that now have been disclosed, and this is a quote, tend to support the thesis of the plaintiffs that the Canadian Forces is a prejudiced, homophobic organization with an irrational fear of homosexuals. So she had them on the run, but, and this is the final point, it took political leadership to finally put an end to this policy because of this woman. 
In September of 1991, the new Minister of Justice, a woman named Kim Campbell, Kim Campbell wrote a letter to the new Minister of National Defense, Marcel Mass. And she said, you know, dear colleague, you've asked that I provide you with my opinion about the court cases. This Douglas person, what, what do we do about her? And I'm not going to read you the whole letter, time is marching on, but the last paragraph she says, this is her advice to her colleague, the Minister of National Defense. In my opinion, this is not just a weak case, it is a case in which there is no arguable position to put to the courts. The outstanding court cases ought to be settled, and the policy ought to be abandoned in favor of a policy which is non-discriminatory. So that's what Campbell wrote to the Minister of National Defense. And the last letter I want to share with you was just a few weeks before Michelle's victory in the federal court. And it was a letter that was sent to the Prime Minister of Canada from the Minister of National Defense. Dear Prime Minister, as you may be aware, we're rapidly approaching the next important milestone in the Douglas case, which challenges the Canadian Forces policy on sexual orientation. And he goes through the evidence and he says, I've been given advice by Kim Campbell, the Minister of Justice, about what we do about this. And here's what he finally said, and these are the words I want to leave you with. He said, if we proceed to try the Douglas case, there will be three unavoidable consequences. A, we will be perceived as refusing to acknowledge the existing law of Canada. This may well result in the award of punitive and exemplary damages. The Canadian forces, B, the Canadian forces' reputation will be brought into disrepute. And C, the evidence generated at trial will seriously embarrass the government. I urge that you give your immediate approval, Prime Minister, to settle the Douglas case and the other pending sexual orientation cases and to abandon the Canadian forces policy with respect to sexual orientation in accordance with the advice and recommendations previously provided by the Attorney General of Canada. Michelle, you took them on. You won a victory for all of those who had been victims of the purge. And I salute you and I thank you for that. Thank you very much. Haran has led us through many activities this week, and it's been, we've relied on him heavily, and we thank you for your leadership. I always appreciate what you bring to our organization. I'd like to thank my co panelists. Um, I've listened now the last two days to Sven talking about the documents, and every time there's a new piece of information that blows my mind. Just right now, Kim Campbell. Um, I was a young political reporter. I covered the uh, Tory leadership convention to which she, for, that led to her short-lived time as prime minister, and it's incredible to think she played, she played a role of influence in that moment in time. My name is Reva Harrison, as, as Haran introduced me. In addition to my, my role at the museum, I'm also co-chair of the Purge Advisory Council with my colleague Doug Elliott. The Purge Advisory Council was founded uh, less than a year ago by the museum to advise us on the creation of our exhibit. It's a group of survivors and scholars from across the country, and they're working with us to talk about their experiences and their knowledge and help us build an exhibit that reflects that moment in time. Sven's research is a really important part of the process because, as it turns out, we don't have all the documents yet, and they're being released probably as we talk now, more and more information coming to light. And so his research is very important to our project. I'd like to thank Michelle Douglas, of course, um, an inspiration to us all and someone I hope never to follow again in a speaking order. <laughs> we have so many special guests here today in this room. We have purge survivors and pioneers who led the class action suit, many of them in the corner over there, but others sprinkled through the room individuals who have made tremendous sacrifices to end the purge and to make Canadian workplaces safer for people like me and many of us in this room. 
For that, we owe a tremendous debt of gratitude. And I'm continu continually humbled to work with you and hear your stories. Thank you. I'm honored to be part of today's discussion. This is a conversation that seems timelier today and more critical than ever before against a backdrop of eroding rights from don't say gay legislation to attacks on the rights of transgendered people. It is a sobering and challenging time. Sven and I were talking before we came up on stage. Um, both him and I have political backgrounds, working in politics, him elected, me not, but um, nevertheless working uh, for many years in politics and feeling like we're seeing something we haven't seen before. It reminds us that progress on human, human rights is a journey, and it's an uneven and rocky journey. And we've had our own uneven and rocky journey here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. In 2020, we think back to that very first year of the coronavirus, I recall picking up the paper, and, and for the first time ever, in my career in journalism, and that is my background, as I noted, every single page of our local newspaper was dedicated to the pandemic, even arts and even sports. It was all about disruption and chaos and uncertainty in the industries and job loss. I'd never seen that type of breadth of coverage, not any royal wedding, not any natural disaster, not any political upheaval. This was really an epic time in journalism. But there was a story that pop uh, popped through, <laughs> and it popped through locally, and it was the struggles of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Um, that is a story that broke through that pandemic coverage, and it was allegations of racism, sexism, and homophobia at the museum. I was not at the museum of the time, but like many of you, I'm a lifelong Winnipegger. I was stunned and impacted by the coverage, which included stories about censoring our gay marriage exhibit for school tours, as Doug referenced earlier. The museum launched, launched an external review into what was happening, and it was a dark and difficult time for the museum. Our partners, like the Purge Fund and others, expressed their anger and disappointment. As Doug noted, there was a suspension of the relationship and a long road back to regaining enough trust to continue to work together. We have new leadership at many levels at the museum, including the very top with our CEO, Aisha Khan, who is a wonderful individual, and we, I feel like we are in fantastic hands under her leadership. We also performed the external review and have worked to implement the recommendations of that review. It was around this time that I came to the museum. It was just over a year ago, and what a year it's been. And it's been a time of change, and of course, a time of challenge with, with the pandemic. It has not made, this does not, has not made operating easy. Our relationship with the Purge Fund, Purge Fund resumed, and I am very grateful to the fund and the leaders and, and those who are willing to continue to work with us, who wanted to give us a chance to hold us accountable to meeting a higher standard and giving us the opportunity to build trust and gain the, the, um, the trust we had lost with purge survivors and fund members, as well as with the broader community. We have made strides, and we know we have room to grow yet. We know there's only one way to get there, and it is by continuing to do the hard work and being intentional and not losing sight of the need to be vigilant. There were 60 recommendations that came from the external review into what happened here at the museum. The final report was released publicly last summer, and I'm pleased to say that all the recommendations have either been implemented or are ongoing. Some recommendations are initiatives that will never be completed, because they include shifts in the way we work, such as more training in EDI, anti-racism practices, how to handle harassment, areas that are always going to evolve and we need to stay on top of. We are working at decolonizing our policies and procedures, our contracts. It is intricate and important work. One example of this, we are embarking this summer on the de development of our next strategic plan, and the process is being designed to embed decolonization into the plan's development. This is a significant, important step forward for us, and I've not worked for an organization to date that has taken that step to embed that type of thought into its strategic planning. 
We're taking steps to increase and improve our 2SLGBTQ plus content within our galleries, including the creation, of course, of the Purge exhibit. We are developing more 2S content, and we've been working with Elder Albert and others on that, and we have recently revised some of our transgendered content after discussions with the community. As many of you will have noticed, we moved recently to implement our gender-inclusive washrooms. This was a move overdue for the museum, but an important one. And we're... Thank you. We now have a Rainbow Equity Council to increase staff engagement and give new voice to issues from our staff within our workforce and our operations. I see many of the members of that Equity Council here today, and I thank you for coming out this morning. We have new leaders at every level, people like Haran, like Scott DeGroote, who's our lead curator on LGBTQ issues and the Purge exhibit. Um, we have members of our equity, Rainbow Equity Council who work all over this building. They welcome people into the galleries, they take schools on tours, they're working on uh, all kinds of programming and activities, and we're very proud of their work. We've made a commitment to provide pathways for career growth and development to our staff, and we're following through on those commitments. Over the past year, dozens of staff have participated in job competitions that have resulted, in some cases, in promotions, and in other cases, bringing permanence and stability to jobs that were temporary and precarious. Why is this important? It's about committing to our staff. It's about providing security and opportunity, which are two of the most important things we can do as leaders. As the Purge has demonstrated, the workforce can be a perilous and dangerous place. We have a role as leaders, a big role, in creating stability and the conditions of advancement for those we care about, our employees. Finally, when we get requests to censor tours, and we do still get them, we say no. We stand by our content. <laughs> we stand by our content, such as our gay marriage exhibit, and note the importance of this milestone in our collective human rights history. We occasionally lose a tour to this stance, but that is okay. Even these tough conversations with parents and schools are an important part of our education efforts, which are at the heart of what we do here at the museum. At the end of the day, I don't want to get into a, any longer of a checklist of things we're doing. We know our work here is not done. We know we need to continue to talk openly about our experiences and the importance of not being complacent. Human rights history unfolds as we speak, and every day we are seeing new things in the headlines that give us rise for concern. We know our rights are fragile. One of the ways we're going to make sure we don't lose sight of our own history is just in the work we do. And one example is the next version of our Pride Tour. We will talk about our own history as part of the other things we do as a museum and the other issues we need to note, such as the purge. I first heard about The Purge as a young reporter. I was covering theatre, and this was quite a while ago now. It was in the mid-90s, and a Winnipeg playwright... It's funny how many connections back to Winnipeg we're hearing today. A Winnipeg playwright named Brian Drader had written a play called The Fruit Machine, and it was uh, being put on locally, and I was a very young reporter, a young member of our community, and it wasn't a story I was familiar with. I did not understand why every Canadian wasn't outraged marching in the streets as I started to hear more about the story of the purge. Fast forward to today, and what an honour and a privilege it is to be involved in shining additional light on this time in our country's history. Our exhibit, which will open in 2024, all things going smoothly, will include the travelling component, as, as Doug noted, and we will delve into Purge history and tell many of the amazing stories that we have heard, and certainly I've had a privilege to hear even more about over the last few days. We've talked about dark rooms. For some, a dark room is that image of an interrogation room with a single light bulb, where hideous, lengthy interrogations took place for hours on end. We heard about dark rooms, or I've heard about dark rooms, where people were whisked away from their homes and workplaces 
taken to sheds or cottages, their whereabouts unknown. I heard about police coming to people's homes and turning the space, the sanctity of their home and their family, into dark rooms of interrogation and terror. I think Sven called it evil, and I think there is no other way to characterize this moment in time. Yesterday, I heard the story of a lesbian couple who rarely open their drapes in their home for fear of being seen, of being watched, of being persecuted. The terror of the purge has created many dark rooms in many different ways. The purge went on for decades, and the new evidence Sven is bringing to light suggests the number affected is much greater than we ever knew. Some of the folks affected were young idealists eager to serve their country, only to have promising careers as officers and civilians cut short because of who they danced with at a bar. They were miles from home, naive, scared, and lost everything that mattered to them. Others were older and had distinguished service records and were exemplary employees, like we heard Michelle's story. Those amazing accomplishments and records didn't protect them from persecution, which was swift and cruel. These are many of the stories we will honor and share in our exhibit to be part of saying never again to the draconian practices that resulted in the purge and impacted so many people. There's a lot of heavy in the world, and there's a lot of heavy in the room. And, and this week, those of you participating in the conference have had, had lots of hard discussions. We know we are in a, a time where we cannot take our rights for granted and that our rights are being threatened. So I want to leave you with one thing that puts a spring in my step when I come to work here every day. Each and every week, we engage with hundreds, if not thousands, of school children in human rights education. Our school programs have become so popular, we're actually sold out. And we are now looking for new delivery approaches so we can expand our education and reach even more people across our country, in other countries, and around the world. It's what we call a nice problem to have. How can we grow? We focus on teaching children and youth about human rights, which will include the purge, and how to be what we call an upstander. Our upstander program is about inspiring the next generation to stand up for their rights and the rights of others, and it helps them gain that confidence and tools to have those conversations. This is why our education mandate is so essential, and it's at the core of what we do. When we are gone and our contributions are part of history, our future will be in the hands of our upstanders. Teaching the leaders of tomorrow might be the most important thing we can do at the museum. It is also why we need you, our community, the activists in this room, and beyond these doors, to push us, to teach us, to hold us accountable, to work with us, so we can make the most of that education mandate. Thank you so much for your time here for day, for today and for all the work that each and every one of you do to make our world a better place. Thank you, Reva. It is, uh, it is a great time to be here at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights, and we're in the in a time uh, right for change. Um, there is a question here. Are there questions on, um, uh, the, from the floor? Sorry. If not, I can start with the questions here, and if you think of something, put your hand up. I've got Savannah and Maya with the mic again. Um, so why is there so little awareness of the purge, and why don't we talk about it? Why do so few people, pe so few people know about it? Douglas? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm happy to take that one. Well, <clears throat> first of all, um, I did my undergraduate in history at Western University, and I can tell you that I learned almost nothing about LGBT people in general uh, in all of that uh, history. We have been erased from history in general. Let's start from that proposition. When I learned about Oscar Wilde's plays in high school, I, they didn't mention that he was gay. Uh, I had no idea until much later on. Uh, so uh, that's the one fundamental problem, is that LGBT history is invisible. Uh, let's be clear about this. This LGBT purge exhibit in 2024, this will be the first major LGBT history exhibit in Canada, period, in over 150 years of our history. 
We've always been here, as Albert said, for thousands of years, and it's taken this long to have any of our history considered. So let's start from that fundamental uh, proposition. I think the other reason, uh, the other two reasons we haven't heard about this is uh, one that I mentioned earlier that uh, in our LGBT community, we've been really bad at intergenerational le learning. This happened to an earlier generation. It happened to an older generation of LGBT Canadians. And frankly, uh, you know, let's be candid folks. We have a very youth-centered culture in the LGBT community. Uh, we can learn from Indigenous people about honoring our elders and about intergenerational teaching. We're not very good at it. We need to get better at it. We've got treasures like Michelle Douglas who have a lifetime of experience and wisdom to pass on to that younger generation. People like my nephew, Christopher Elliott, who's in the audience learning and recording right now. And I hope preserving this for history too. The third reason I think that uh, we don't know about the purge is because of our great national myth in Canada. Canadians believe that we're really nice people. We don't do nasty things to other people. That's, those are the Americans. They do that kind of thing, you know? Because the Americans, at least they're honest about their bigotry. Canadians are very polite. Nobody was pounding the table in the House of Commons saying, get rid of the deviants. No, they were having polite conversation, sending memos back and forth to external affairs. You know, Norman Robertson calling someone into his office at external affairs and having a nice glass of sherry or a cup of tea and saying, terribly sorry, old chap, we found out you were queer, you have to go. Uh, this story is a, one of the most common reactions I get to this story when people find out about it, the two common reactions. Number one, I can't believe this happened in Canada. That's the most common reaction I get from people because it seems so inconsistent with our view of who we are. And the second is a deep sense of shame. Uh, I remember very well uh, my aunt who's over 90 who saw the fruit machine on TV and she felt compelled to call me and say, Doug, I just watched the movie. And she said, for the first time in my long life, I'm ashamed to be a Canadian. That's hard to do. Thanks, Doug. Michelle. <laughs> Actually, did, did you want, are you pointing to Michelle? Did you have something? No? Nope. Okay. It says. Oh, <laughs> um, there is a question here for Michelle. <laughs> uh, Michelle, did you realize that your case would be so groundbreaking and historic? Thanks for that uh, really beautiful acknowledgement earlier. Um, just to have your community see you is a beautiful thing. I was about 23 years old when that happened to me. I never imagined I'd be an activist. But I was able to find a way to kind of, I guess, chart a course, learn from leaders, watching HIV AIDS uh, leaders, um, other LGBTQ2 plus folks be activists, and I was learning about that. But I never expected it would be a big deal. I was ashamed of what had happened to me, and when the first reporter asked, could they cover the story, I said, well, well only anonymously. And in a gesture of decency, a Toronto, store, a Toronto Star reporter um, by the name of Michelle Landsberg, a famous feminist, amazing reporter and uh, uh, journalist, did write about my case anonymously and said, I'm doing this as an act of generosity because it'll never be the same for you again. And she was right. Um, but, you know, it's really by being inspired by others and standing with others that you gain your most strength. I never 
believed what would happen to me would have a big impact. But I always believed I was worthy. I always believed love should come my way just as I would give it. And I think those were the grounding principles for me that kind of allowed me to um, uh, make a path in activism. I was never more courageous than anyone here, but I did believe in self-worth, and you should too, I hope. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. And I think um, I've got Sven to respond to it, and then I will go to the question, Savannah. Yeah. Yeah, I just um, I wanted to say something too about, I guess, partly back to the, the first question you asked, and that is the, one of the reasons why the story is, is not told and is not known, even in many cases among members of our own community, is that tragically many of the victims of the purge um, felt such an incredible sense of shame that they were not prepared to share their story, even with their families. And I was so struck by this, for example, when I recently reviewed the document, some of you may have seen the story about um, Ambassador John Watkins, uh, who was one of the most senior and respected uh, external affairs officials, ambassador to the Soviet Union, uh, gay man. Um, and uh, he, was, um, he retired in 1963 and in 1964, was subjected to the most barbaric interrogation. He was retired peacefully, living in Paris. They interrogated him in Paris, then in London, and then they flew him to Montreal, and under interrogation, he had a heart attack and he died. And there were over a thousand pages of documents about the John Watkins story, also very sadly revealing that this was not something that was just driven by a a couple of overzealous um, uh, officials in government. It was driven at the very highest levels with the full knowledge and indeed active encouragement of the Prime Minister of the day, Lester Pearson. Um, but what was so tragic about this was in, re in viewing these documents, which by the way were not disclosed to us by the Department of Justice, over a thousand pages of documents, we got seven pages. Um, but I did get the documents from the journalist. And what was so tragic about this was under interrogation, John Watkins, imagine this distinguished ambassador, somebody who had served his country so well, broke down and said, you know, he says, you're right. I am a criminal. I deserve to be in prison. And this was John Watkins, the ambassador. And so, tragically, so many of the people who were the victims of the purge internalized this. They felt the shame, in some cases, of, of having shared names with other people and so on. Some of them committed suicide. But certainly, they were not prepared to, to, to share those stories. And it was only because of the courage of people uh, like uh, Michelle and, and, and Wayne and Todd and, and other survivors um, facilitated by the class action and, and, and the brilliant legal team that, that the stories came out. But much of that internalized shame was never shared. Thank you, Send. I think that's really important to remember as well. Savannah. Hello, folks. My name is Steve Desha, and um, I'm a purge survivor. And there are some very notable names here today, but we would be remiss, in my opinion. As Sven just pointed out, many of us who are survivors never spoke of it. it. Would be even very difficult to stand up in a room of friends and acknowledge the fact that we are survivors. But you are amongst a large group of survivors, and some names have been acknowledged, but I would ask my fellow survivors, those of us that are recognized, and perhaps some in the crowd who have not yet been, to stand up amongst our friends and show our faces all, please. Thank you. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I just wanted to say a quick word about a project from the Purge Front that we haven't talked about yet, uh, which was emerging from the Purge. And I think we 
talked about a lot of projects that shed light on this part of history that was so, uh, so sad and so heavy. And I think it's really important to acknowledge what happened, but it's also important to uh, take interest in what is happening and what needs to happen. And so that's what this project was about, emerging from the purge. It was a study of what uh, the state of inclusion of 2S LGBTQ plus people was in federal government today in Canada. And from that, so extensive interviews and documentary reading uh, and just surveys and stuff like that, we uh, had 161 indicators of like what is inclusion. And so we basically graded a couple of departments from the federal government. And from that, we uh, wrote 23 recommendations. And so I'm really looking forward to seeing the government implement those 23 recommendations throughout the government. So yeah, that's something that we have look to look forward to. I think hope is important too. Thank you for that, thank you. Do you want to say something? Merci beaucoup. Uh, yeah. Merci beaucoup, Olivia. I just want to acknowledge that's uh, Olivia Baker from, uh, from the uh, Fondation Emergence who worked with the gal on emerging for the pur from the purge. And just to be clear about that, that was another outcome of the class action settlement that we paid for that study to tell the federal government the state of LGBT inclusion in the federal government, which is uh, unsurprisingly a work in progress at the top level, good policies, but implementation uh, very spotty. And unfortunately, I think as in many places, uh, the CMHR is doing much better now, it gets treated, it, you get lip service. It gets treated as an afterthought. There's no financial resources do, devoted to it. There's no commitment to top level inclusion. Uh, it's just a, a policy that get posted on a website. We need to do a lot better. Thank you, Doug. Did I see Lynn? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, hi, my name's Lynn, Lynn Golliker. I'm also a Métis woman, um, origins back to the Red River, so welcome. Um, I also want to talk about origin stories, and I want to link this to First Nations, Innu and Métis women predominantly. I think what the colonizers did when they came here, I don't know how to express it. I think anybody that are of those origins do not have to, can feel it right now, what the colonizer has done to women. And I also want to extend that to, to broaden your minds and think about it as femininity and fem, if you want to think about it in the LGBTQ world and what it's meant over the years. I think one prime example and why I talk about the origins and stories and what colonization has done for the first peoples of any country that suffered colonization, what they did to them is they moved in and took power away from them, vital power away from them and they only recognized the men in the society or who looked like men in society. They gave it to them and we're living with it today and that has affected who in the purge and how we've suffered as well. We must not forget whether you're gay, lesbian or trans, that the enemy within the Canadian military is being a woman, being femininity and being weak. It has nothing to do with being masculine because all you have to do is don that mask and you can be a really great soldier. Inside, you may never be the perfect man, the perfect thing that the Canadian military at one time wanted you to be, and I really hope it's changing for folks that are still wearing the uniform, that you can be a soldier without being a man, and what that entails, because I'm using it as a metaphor. And I really hope that the Canadian Museum on Human Rights can capture that and not portray it as valorizing masculinity I don't know what to call. I have femme in my mind as the opposing, I don't know what it is for masculinity, but valorizing the masculine because that's part of the origin stories and where it comes from and the domination that is created and the powerless that is created that, that makes me infuriated, makes me angry and has made me suffer from the day I was born. I think I was an activist, I said that to somebody. I think I was an activist when I popped out of the womb. I don't know why. <laughs> Thank you for listening. 
Thank you so much, Lynn. So um, it is 12 o'clock, but uh, with that being said, and Lynn, you ended on a, a, a great note, and I think it is hope, um, and I think it is uh, challenging us, and I'm so grateful uh, that you brought that up, because it is, it is a challenge for the museum to ensure that we're, we're doing what we are set up to do, which is tell the stories of the people, uh, and not focus so much on what the history or historical accuracy is too much, because who told us the history? and who wrote the history, right? So those are things that we need to always keep in mind and have conversations with and really understand how we move forward. I'm grateful to have you uh, as a part of the council uh, and Albert and uh, everyone um, on that Purge Advisory Council with such a diverse group of folks who are going to help us build that and work together uh, to, uh, to achieve that goal. And there was a question about um, education. It is that hope that this museum then becomes, because we do go into thousands of classrooms, so that history does get taught because we're not going to say no because uh, people are asking us to skip an exhibit. So it will go into classrooms. Uh, and uh, on that note, thank you so much again uh, for visiting our fair hamlet of Winnipeg. Uh, and, uh, and if you're staying on, we'll see you in the parties. If I do something funny, it was because I was drunk. Um, but other than that, look forward to celebrating our successes and look forward to planning for the future. Uh, thank you so very much once again. And thank you to the tech folks. Thank you to Chandra, Nicholas, Angeliki, um, Maya, uh, Lindsay, and uh, Savannah at, for doing this and putting this all together. And thank you for all the tech folks. Thank you for breakfast. And our interpreters. Um, and our interpreters. Uh, I know I speak really, really fast, so thank you so very much for being generous. We did it on time, folks. Have a great weekend. And, oh, and the wristbands will allow you for the full day to visit our museum. So please uh, stay, enjoy, and have a good time. Thank you. Safe travels.